هنبتدي ان شاء الله السيشن اللي قبل الاخير اللي قبل اللي قبل يعني الاخير اللي قبل اللانش بسيشن تاني على الانترفنشنال راديو برمونولوجي والارت اوف ريجيد برونكوسكوبي اند ستنت ابلكيشن بروفيسور لورانزو كوربيتا فروم ايطالي على الاونلاين اتفضل My friends from uh, wonderful Egypt, uh, thank you for uh, your uh, invitation also uh, this uh, year. Uh, my topic uh, will be art of rigid bronchoscopy and uh, stent, stent application. Uh, you know that uh, this heart began with uh, Kilian uh, uh, more than uh, 100 of years ago, uh, but uh, uh, was this uh, big man, uh, Professor uh, Dumont, uh, who introduced uh, again uh, 30 years ago uh, these uh, procedures uh, to treat uh, uh, the strictures of airways and uh, with the use of the new uh, stents uh, and, uh, and the laser inside the airways. Uh, I had the privilege uh, to, to meet Professor Dumont uh, in Florence uh, two years ago. Unfortunately, he passed away. He was a, really a genius. But uh, uh, he was also uh, with uh, Professor Cavaliere, an Italian uh, uh, pulmonologist uh, who developed uh, uh, this uh, uh, procedure. And uh, when we uh, talk about art of rigid bronchoscopy, we have uh, to uh, be aware that uh, there are some uh, determinants of competence. Now uh, we have to be uh, more uh, careful to the competence uh, when we begin uh, a procedure, a very complex procedures like uh, rigid bronchoscopy. And uh, uh, so uh, this is a long pathway uh, to uh, uh, become uh, competent in the uh, rigid bronchoscopy, uh, beginning from uh, knowledges uh, of the uh, diseases uh, to treat, uh, knowledges of the instruments, uh, and then uh, uh, to develop uh, uh, the skills. Uh, and uh, uh, we need also a, a special attitudes and behaviors uh, to work inside uh, uh, the uh, airways. Uh, for these reasons, uh, uh, many, some countries like United States uh, developed uh, uh, some uh, uh, documents uh, for the training and competence uh, on uh, interventional uh, pulmonology in general. And uh, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, framework of the procedures uh, for uh, interventional pulmonologists, uh, the, uh, uh, this document uh, put uh, also rigid bronchoscopy and uh, uh, recommend, strongly recommend a structured uh, uh, course uh, of uh, um, almost one year or, or more than one year, uh, but to, not only in the uh, United States, but also in Italy, uh, we uh, organized a, a master. Uh, we are at the 11th uh, uh, edition of uh, the course, our master in bronchoscopy international pulmonology that lasts one year from the basic bronchoscopy uh, to uh, operative bronchoscopy with the use of uh, uh, rigid bronchoscopy. And uh, um, there, are, there is a, a standard uh, proposed by the this document of many international societies and for rigid bronchoscopy that require quantitative and qualitative assessment of competence. For rigid bronchoscopy, a minimum of 50 procedures are required to the, in the fellowship. And uh, a rigid intubation uh, it, without a subsequent qualifying associated procedure is insufficient. So we need also uh, some 
qualitative uh, uh, examination uh, after uh, this uh, um, course of 50, uh, 50 procedures. Not only the bronchoscopy, but also the procedures uh, uh, that we can do uh, with the rigid bronchoscopy, like uh, rigid core debiking, uh, the place, placement and removal of endobronchial stents, silicon hybrid and dynamic, uh, rigid sequential uh, dilation, uh, mechanical debiking, uh, foreign body removal, and management of massive hemoptysis. But uh, also, uh, not only the mechanical debugging, uh, uh, but also the use of ablative techniques uh, with the laser, with the APC, with the electrocautery, with uh, cryotherapy, with the photodynamic therapy. And uh, at the end, uh, in the operative uh, uh, bronchoscopy, uh, we need uh, uh, to develop a, a competence on endobronchial uh, stenting. Uh, why uh, rigid bronchoscopy? Uh, in Italy, uh, we, recommend, we strongly recommend for operative bronchoscopy the use of rigid bronchoscopy. Uh, in other countries, uh, like also United States, uh, it's uh, very popular. Also the flexible bronchoscopy for operative bronchoscopy for uh, operation, but in Italy uh, we recommend, uh, in our schools, uh, we recommend rigid bronchoscopy. Why? Because there are some advantages, uh, because uh, there are excellent control of air airway patency and the possibility to dilate and to uh, solve uh, problems of uh, strictures very rapidly. Uh, and uh, is, uh, <clears throat> there is an ex excellent management of side effects. Uh, there is the possibility to recover larger bi biopsy samples, uh, use laser, stenting, uh, very big uh, forceps. There are also some disadvantages uh, because it needs uh, uh, general anesthesia, but we think that maybe is an advantage. Uh, because you can uh, operate, uh, operate uh, uh, more easily. And uh, uh, the other problem is the difficult access to peripheral or upper lobe uh, bronchi, but you can use uh, the flexible bronchoscopy, bronchoscope uh, inside uh, the rigid bronchoscopy. And uh, uh, the, the other problem is the uh, very long uh, learning curve, so we lack uh, of experienced uh, operators. Uh, what are the indications uh, for operative bronchology with the uh, rigid bronchoscopy? Uh, Pre-surgery in some uh, patients, uh, uh, like a bridge to uh, the surgery. Uh, uh, the more uh, used uh, uh, is a palliation in lung uh, neoplasms. Uh, treatment of benign endobronchial tumors, in situ carcinoma, uh, microinvasive tumors. Treatment of tracheal stenosis, uh, tracheobronchial lesions, uh, bronchopleural fistulas, uh, and uh, uh, not only operative, but also endoscopic volume reduction uh, to, for depositioning of uh, valves, uh, the management of hemoptysis, and uh, uh, we use the, uh, the rigid bronchoscopy also for uh, complex diagnosis when uh, there are uh, many procedures like IBAS, uh, linear IBAS, uh, uh, radial IBAS, uh, uh, navigator, navigation, etc. Uh, uh, we prefer to intubate the patient with rigid bronchoscopy. Um, but uh, uh, um, when, uh, which technique of uh, uh, all uh, that I mentioned before, and when and in whom, in whom patient uh, we have to use. It depends uh, on uh, many situations. The urgency, uh, the type of obstruction, uh, intersaluminal mixed, the extent of disease, the performance status, the individual experience and preference, uh, the local availability and uh, the cost. Uh, uh, 
For example, for uh, maybe mechanical debridement uh, of uh, with the uh, visible microscopy and laser, laser uh, uh, they are used for intraluminal or uh, submucosal uh, lesion, uh, and uh, it's very rapid. It's very rapid. Uh, it's uh, re repeatable, and uh, uh, complications are very very low. Uh, only sometimes hemorrhage, uh, but very 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 low in expert hands. Uh, uh, on the contrary, brachytherapy, cryotherapy is uh, uh, very slow uh, to uh, to act. So uh, it's. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the urgency, is uh, uh, better to use uh, laser and rigid and mechanical debridement. Also, the stent have a, have a rapid uh, uh, give re rapid uh, results. Uh, the choice of treatment: if uh, laser debiking or stenting, for example, depends also. Uh, on the uh, on the uh, characteristics uh, of the strictures, if the strictures is uh, uh, vegetant and voluminal, uh, it's better to use uh, laser at the biking. Uh, but is, if it's uh, extrinsic, it's better to use uh, stenting. Also, when it's mixed, that you can use uh, laser, but also uh, complementary uh, to uh, laser. Uh, in uh, benign neoplasms, uh, uh, the operative bronchoscopy could be radical. Uh, in the intermediate malignancy, uh, like uh, carcinoids, uh, adenocystic carcinoma, mucopidermoid carcinoma, the, uh, uh, the uh, operative bronchoscopy is very useful for palliation, plus surgery integrated treatment with radiotherapy and they selected only in very, very few patients uh, is uh, curative. And the targets uh, are the diagnosis. We prefer to use directly uh, the reason bronchoscopy for, to uh, uh, take uh, samples for diagnosis uh, for the uh, very high risk uh, of uh, uh, bleeding uh, with this uh, kind of, uh, uh, of lesions. Prevention of infections uh, when there is uh, a, a, an obstruction, improvement of ventilation, borderline patients, uh, preoperative evaluation of disease, uh, uh, treatment of life threatening bleeding, and palliative treatment in non surgical uh, patients. In the malignant bronchial tumors, uh, the, uh, we have 30% uh, of patients with the non-resectable lung cancer that develop uh, obstruction of the airways. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, palliative use of operative can, uh, uh, can improve dyspnea, hypoxemia, cough, hemoptysis, infections, uh, and uh, uh, prolong sometimes uh, uh, the life of these patients. Uh, the stent, uh, the art of the positioning of stent is another art that began, began the, the name comes from the dentist, not the pulmonologist. And, uh, but uh, the, the, the use, uh, a very popular use, uh, began with the uh, Montgomery uh, stent that were uh, the first dedicated uh, tracheal stand, the T tube, and uh, after that, uh, in uh, uh, 1990, with this uh, first uh, um, uh, uh, article of uh, Dumont uh, about the dedicated tracheal bronchial stand, and then uh, by uh, Cavaliere. Uh, as you know, we have uh, two um, main groups of uh, stands: silicon and uh, metallic. Uh, unfortunately, there is uh, uh, not an adjustment because we consider many, many uh, characteristics and uh, there is not one kind of stent with all these characteristics. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, 
that are but is we, we have also some new stands uh, above uh, uh, this in these uh, figures it's very difficult to uh, to know and to have the skill to use all of, of that uh, the characteristic of the Dumont stand are that there are different sizes we are uh, anchoring uh, stats uh, that prevent uh, the uh, dislocation uh, a low cost uh, in comparison to the metallic stent uh, easy insertion but uh, uh, easy removal uh, in comparison to uh, metallic stent is well tolerated, tolerated there is no biological interaction and uh, is uh, is uh, resistant to uh, compression uh, uh, it's uh, uh, mandatory to use the visible endoscopy uh, to insert uh, the uh, silicon Dumont, Dumont stand. Metallic stand uh, were uh, very used in the past with the Ultraflex. Uh, then, uh, uh, after uh, a, a warning uh, of a, of a FDA. Uh, uh, they use uh, reduced, uh, but now we have a new generation of metallic stands, uh, hybrid, covered, metallic stands. Uh, the more popular are that, the Microtech, the Loifen, and also in the uh, United States, the Aero, Aero stand, the Silmet of Novatech, that is the same uh, company of the Dumont stand. stand. Uh, what is the outcomes uh, after stenting? Uh, uh, is the, uh, after stenting uh, in uh, malignant airway disease, airway disease uh, is uh, uh, not uh, uh, very good, not very po positive, but uh, it's a very, very good uh, uh, bridge uh, to complementary uh, um, treatment uh, like, for example, uh, radiotherapy. And uh, as uh, you can see, uh, that there is a, a, a shift of this uh, curve uh, when uh, it's used the uh, adjuvant radiotherapy uh, after uh, stenting. Um, we have to manage also complications that are different for silicon stents and metallic self-extendable. Uh, for silicon stents, uh, is the secretion garment, uh, uh, displacement, migration, and uh, obstruction by granuloma and plastic tissue. For metallic self-extendable, uh, uh, granuloma more than uh, uh, silicon, sometimes fracture and uh, wall uh, perforation. What are the indications? Uh, are five uh, major indications uh, extrinsic, uh, extrinsic uh, compression from tumors or uh, lymph nodes, stabilization of uh, airway patency after endoscopic removal of interluminal growing in cancer, um, treatment of benign structures, uh, for example, uh, structures after uh, uh, tracheostomy, stabilization of collapsing airways, and treatment of. Uh, fistulas. Um, here are some uh, some exam uh, example of uh, imaginary airway stenosis. Uh, uh, the stent have uh, a splinting effect in uh, uh, compression uh, uh, lesions. Uh, here you can see a metallic uh, metallic stent, but you can use also the uh, silicon stent. And also, is very important, like a barrier uh, effect for malignant airway stenosis with, the, for example, with silicon, silicon stands. And uh, uh, another um, very frequent use is in uh, benign, benign airway stenosis, in complex stenosis, when it's not possible uh, to operate it for some reasons for comorbidities, for examples, 
And uh, in this case, uh, uh, we can uh, treat uh, this uh, stenosis with the uh, stents uh, in two steps. The first step is the dilation with the wisdom microscopy. Second step uh, is splint uh, the unstable tracker segment with a removable stent. Uh, the, uh, we have seen uh, the theoretical characteristic of the optimal waste tent. <laughs> First, uh, cheap, easy to place, easy to remove, uh, no or few complications, uh, suitable for most indication, benign malignant, uh, adaptable to peculiar, peculiar anatomical situation. And uh, in uh, this, uh, uh, ways. <laughs> uh, we have uh, uh, different characteristics. Uh, the, the silicon are cheaper, the metallic are uh, easier to place, the silicon is easier to remove, uh, different uh, indications, uh, for example, in uh, benign structures, uh, it's mandatory to use uh, silicon. And uh, uh, the ad adaptability is uh, uh, in a cool, for example, is more in a, uh, metallic. So at the end, uh, we can see that uh, silicon stands uh, win, but uh, we uh, have to uh, use uh, both uh, depending on uh, different uh, situations. What are the future perspectives uh, um, for courtesy of Dr. Tony Rosero Barcelona? Uh, we have this uh, slide with this uh, uh, future uh, stand, drug eluting stands, a uh, new manufacturing, the absorbable and uh, 3D printing, uh, printing like this, uh, for example, you can see. Uh, is uh, customized. This is customized with the opening, with the hole, with an opening for a, for example, for a, a upper uh, bronchus, the right bronchus. Um, I I will show you uh, now um, some cases. Uh, for example, a case of uh, positioning of the of Dumon uh, or epsilon Dumon. Uh, with the rigid bronchoscopy uh, in a uh, cancer of a trachea. Uh, the first step is to position the rigid bronchoscopy. The second is to treat uh, uh, the lesion uh, and coagulate it uh, and with the laser. And then to the bulk it uh, with the, the uh, rigid bronchoscopy and remove uh, uh, the lesion with the forceps. <clears throat> okay, this is the bulking and we and aspirate uh, pieces of the of the lesions of the lesion uh, after obtaining uh, the uh, patency of the airways, we can insert insert the uh, <coughs> the stent, epsilon stent, uh, with a forcep and so you can see uh, we obtained. Uh, a complete uh, a patency, patency of the uh, of the airways. Uh, I've seen, I've I said before because that uh, there is this FDA recommendation uh, that uh, I would recommend uh, not to use metallic tra uh, tracker stent in patient uh, uh, with benign airway disorders. But uh, there is there are some situation. Uh, very, very rare, but where is uh, uh, better to use it. 
And uh, this is a, a, a situation, uh, a very young uh, man with the uh, obstruction, very severe obstruction of trachea. And uh, uh, you can see here the, uh, uh, the endoscopic uh, uh, aspect. And uh, uh, he was uh, in distress, respiratory distress. So uh, we used, we prefer to use uh, a metallic stamp, metallic stamp uh, because uh, it was a very, very uh, severe, severe situation. It was very, very difficult uh, uh, to pass through through the obstruction with the with the bronchoscopy because it was very, very um, tough, very ri rigid. But the stent uh, passed through uh, the obstruction was uh, released. It is, is a, an Ultraflex Boston scientific uh, stamp. Now it's released. Uh, but uh, remained, uh, remained closed because it was uh, too, too distal. So uh, we had uh, two reposition to reposition the stent okay uh, with the faucet can uh, uh, attract to attract the stent okay and uh, it was it was possible to attract is uh, uh, the stent and uh, open, open it, open it. Okay, now it's uh, more open, and the patient can uh, can breathe. And but uh, after uh, uh, eight hours, it's uh, self expandable. So uh, it was. Uh, uh, <clears throat> almost uh, completely, completely open. Uh, thank you very much. I miss you and I hope to meet you again uh, uh, next year. Bye bye. <laughs>
of these uh, methods are very high. But uh, uh, CT and PET will, in most cases, tell you uh, where some lesion is, uh, but with, and with a certain level, they will tell you uh, what that lesion can be, but in some cases, we will really need some uh, tissue confirmations. But should all abnormal imaging findings will, would require uh, tissue, tissue confirmation? That's the right question. Uh, well, it's kind of easier with IBUS. Uh, IBUS staging of mediastinum, if there are lymph nodes visible on CT and PET, we just uh, do the puncture biopsy and we, if we have rows available, in few minutes, we will have the result like, is this uh, lesion uh, malignant or benign? Is this uh, uh, lymph node uh, malignant uh, or uh, benign? But uh, with the nodules deep in the lung, uh, things are more complicated. First, they are surrounded completely by aerated lung. Second, they are small. They are up to three centimeters in uh, diameter. And as one might uh, think, they are not really, uh, this is not really the, 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 the common finding. In one, one in 500 chest X-ray uh, may reveal a uh, lung mod, uh, nodule. And uh, uh, there is increased prevalence of nodules when, uh, as we do more CT scans. And there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, when we screen uh, with the patients with low dose CT, uh, there is significant reduction of mortality for high risk individuals who are actually screened with low dose uh, CT. We have uh, different methods uh, to show uh, the possibility, uh, is this nodule in the lung malignant or not? And in some cases, it will require biopsy or tissue confirmation. But in which cases, we have different predictive models. Uh, most commonly used are Mayo and uh, Brock uh, clinic model. They have some predictors of malignancy counting in like uh, age, smoking, personal cancer history, nodule diameter, speculation, upper lobe location. Those lo nodules with speculated nodules mostly located in upper lobes are more malignant. As, as you can see from this table, actually the levels of probability are really high. And in some cases, uh, we don't really need biopsy if there is a possibility that this uh, high possibility that this nodule is benign, we will go to watchful waiting. But, and if the nodule is uh, clearly malignant, we will avoid bronchoscopy and uh, uh, we, we, we would not waste time of uh, trans uh, thoracic needle approach or uh, bronchoscopy, and we will continue directly to surgical biopsy or which is in the in the moment, it will be also curative surgery, which is most invasive, but it is curative surgery. And uh, yields from different bronchoscopic sampling uh, techniques, uh, uh, when we uh, are using traditional modalities to assess peripheral nodules, nodules with forceps, it's 88% for visible tumor, but only 57 for peripheral. And when we use brush, uh, it's... Uh, really comparably good for peripheral tumors, but these are only cytological specimens. And uh, blind washing uh, is, has very poor yield and it's practically abandoned in assessing peripheral uh, pulmonary lesions. Uh, I will speak about uh, some advanced bronchoscopic and interventional methods to enhance, uh, which we use to enhance diagnostic yields in peripheral pulmonary lesions. First of all, radial probe EBUS for uh, solitary pulmonary nodule, nodule for me personally is the method of choice. When we combine radial EBUS uh, with uh, fluoroscopy, we get really high yields uh, for uh, lesions less than 25 millimeters in uh, diameter. We can also use radial EBUS for other different diagnostic and therapeutic uh, uh, purposes. And then this is how it looks. We all know the, uh, the, that uh, practically 
we can uh, 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 have the radio EBUS and the convex probe uh, on the same uh, machine. Uh, so it's a, a good tool, excellent tool for staging both uh, use convex probe, uh, probe for staging mediastinum and this mini US uh, uh, probe for peripheral lesion. Uh, rate of complications is really low. It's mostly pneumothorax and in only 0.4% it requires thoracic drainage. What about electromagnetic navigation? Electromagnetic navigation is kind of GPS uh, system for the one uses an electromagnetic field to track eight-way maneuverable sheet and correlates it to the patient CT. It has been used to biopsy nodules down to 10 millimeters. Overall yield is uh, 60 to 70 percent, negative predictive value is 40 percent, and the pulse sensitivity for malignancy of uh, 71 percent. As you can see, very comparable to radial EBUS, but much costlier option. And uh, we use equipment for electromagnetic bronchoscopy uh, in practically three phases. One is the planning phase, when we have to visualize lung anatomy and airways in 3D to mark the targets and plan the pathway like fiducial, uh, like fiducial markers, uh, like we are using GPS on the car, very similar, uh, very similar thing. Software will suggest uh, the best uh, airway route uh, to the target. And in third phase, uh, we have in navigation views, we do the biopsy. But when uh, uh, there was a study uh, three years ago published uh, about electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy to access uh, lung lesions in 1000 subjects, it was the Navigate uh, study. It uh, shows, uh, showed that uh, in uh, like 790 patients, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, 910 patients, uh, it proved in 45.8% it proved uh, malignancy and in 40% it was lung cancer. But in non-malignant, but there was also a significant rate or of non-malignant or even inconclusive result, which is around 41%. And I would like to uh, point out that in uh, those patients with, who were, who, who were uh, tested positive on uh, uh, peripheral lymph node of the, of the peripheral biopsy, actually uh, 67 of, uh, uh, of those patients uh, uh, and there was a study uh, in around uh, 1,000 uh, subjects, uh, and uh, it showed that uh, in 45.8% uh, uh, malignant disease uh, was, uh, was uh, diagnosed with electromagnetic navigation, and it, it was lung cancer in 40.1%. And uh, uh, but there is a problem uh, because uh, in uh, uh, 40.9%, which is a fairly large percentage, uh, there were uh, results either non-malignant or inconclusive. And a uh, lot of patients had with malignant disease had higher pretest probability of malignancy assessed by non-invasive methods, uh, those uh, scores I already mentioned. Second, there was a study uh, uh, which uh, used uh, to combine uh, radial probe uh, with uh, electromagnetic navigation for solitary pulmonary nodules who were uh, around uh, two centimeters in diameter. Radial pr uh, probe uh, located lesions uh, in 77% in 188 patients and electromagnetic navigation in, uh, was used in case that radial probe cannot locate lesion, it was additional 8% of the cases. Radial probe uh, actually uh, in 71.3% uh, 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 was the, the sample was diagnostic and electromagnetic navigation added to positivity of findings in only 4% of the, of the, of the, of the patients. So the, the point is clear. If you already uh, have radial probe uh, EBUS, there is no point to buy electromagnetic navigation, either one or two, either the first 
or the second thing. Uh, virtual bronchoscopic navigation is another good thing, uh, which is actually a software uh, uh, which creates a digitized 3D display uh, as it's seen uh, through a bronchoscope. It actually creates a virtual bronchoscopic navigation based on CT uh, scan. Detail depends highly on quality of CT image and uses CT to chart the path to the lesion. Uh, it can be used uh, in a combination with different techniques like uh, uh, with ultra-thin bronchoscopy, with fluoroscopy, with radial probibus, with ultra-thin scope and radial probibus, which uh, results in really excellent uh, yields. Uh, like in when you combine all three methods, you get yield of 84.4%. And uh, when you combine uh, when you combine virtual bronchoscopic navigation and ultra thin bronchoscopy, guidance to lesion can be achieved in 94.7%. But also the positivity of these methods uh, highly depends of uh, uh, the relation of the tumor uh, with the bronchus. Uh, if the tumor is uh, growing around the bronchus uh, and uh, doing the extramural compression and not directly infiltrating the, the bronchus, the results of course will be lower when we are using the forceps. In those situations we are going to use the transbronchial um, peripheral needle aspiration biopsy. So it looks like this, virtual bronchoscopic navigation. And uh, another thing, which is also excellent, uh, cone beam uh, computed tomography, uh, it's actually uh, the CT machine we can use like a fluoroscopy. When we combine this with virtual bronchoscopic navigation and ultra thin bronchoscopes, the results can be really excellent. Like in malignant lesions uh, in, in, in this study, uh, uh, patients were uh, diagnosed uh, uh, with lesions less than 30 millimeters in uh, the diameters. In, in those patients with classical C-arm uh, fluoroscopy, lesions were invisible. And you can see the yields of, the, of, of combining uh, these methods. But there is also a question that uh, of uh, radiation exposure that uh, uh, both uh, for the patient and for the medical personnel uh, which has to be taken into account. This method uh, sounded promising in the start, but after 2018, uh, 18th, I really didn't hear much about this method. It was, uh, it was used as a transparenchymal nodule access. Uh, it uses CT3D reconstruction to map bronchoscopists uh, to the lesion. And uh, 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 there is a, you, uh, uh, with, the, with the special instrument, you make a point of entry through the fenestra, through the airway, airway uh, wall and do the uh, dilate the tract and take the biopsy directly from the lesions in the lung. And transbronchial cryobiopsy. Cryobiopsies are uh, we use them more in diffuse lung diseases, like in differential diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, different uh, interstitial lung diseases. But it can be also used uh, as a tool to do the biopsy in a peripheral pulmonary lesion. Just uh, you should see that in cryobiopsies, uh, you should see the larger size sample. Uh, then with the forceps biopsy, diagnostic yield is excellent. The complication is uh, moderate bleeding in this study, but uh, also pneumothorax can occur. Uh, and uh, another study showed uh, that uh, uh, in PET positive uh, lesions, uh, 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 practically when we use uh, radial ebus uh, to guide uh, those uh, uh, cryoprobes, we have almost twice better diagnostic yield with transbronchial lung uh, cryobi with transbronchial uh, uh, cryobiopsy of the peripheral nodule than with classical transbronchial biopsy with uh, forceps. So the diagnostic accuracy is 
much much better especially now when we developed uh, when we have now the 1.1 uh, millimeter cryo probe uh, which can be used uh, practically as the cryo forceps and uh, which and with the uh, really no serious uh, problems like uh, bleeding in the settings uh, of peripheral pulmonary lesions of less than 20 millimeter uh, in, di in, in diameter it's feasible it's safe it provides larger tissue samples has higher diagnostic yield than transbronchial biopsy and this approach can be proposed in non-operable or low or intermediate lung cancer risk patients and at the end i would like also to mention robotic bronchoscopy for diagnosis of uh, suspected uh, lung cancer, uh, which uh, was introduced uh, first uh, in clinical use in 2018, but now in 2019, uh, it was proven feasible, safe, uh, uh, with a higher uh, diagnostic uh, yield, uh, because uh, it can combine a lot of different uh, navigational techniques in one machine. Also, um, robotic assisted bronchoscopy system can do other things like microwave ablation, photodynamic therapy, other ablative techniques for inoperable patients so it can be used for therapeutic uh, interventional purposes uh, also. But the limit with uh, robotic assisted bronchoscopy is its cost. Uh, the uh, set for uh, the, the the patients and the the, co the cost of whole uh, equipment is uh, really high and uh, if you have uh, radial probibus if you have fluoroscopy and ultra thin bronchoscopy uh, it would be in my personal opinion enough for the diagnosis of uh, solitary uh, pulmonary nodules. This uh, machine can be reserved only for uh, excellence uh, centers or centers uh, uh, of tertiary level who treat uh, a lot of patients and uh, uh, they that really have uh, also thoracic surgery readily available. And for the end, uh, we, we are not really going to be replaced by robots. I will show you the study in from 1967. One of the authors of the study was Shigeto Ikeda, the person, the doctor who actually invented flexible bronchoscopes. And he used rigid bronchoscopes and rigid guides to do uh, uh, peripheral uh, forceps biopsies using only fluoroscopy uh, in the uh, in the lungs tumors and he had excellent results with this equipment in these days we will call this primitive equipment but he had excellent results now you can see that for tumors in uh, less than two centimeters in diameter he had 92 percent positivity. So, after all, the point is, it's the person, the doctor, the brain behind the machine who is doing the bronchoscopy. As a conclusion, combined approaches appear to offer better yield than conventional techniques with lower risk of complications than uh, transthoracic needle uh, aspiration biopsy. Transbronchial lung cryobiopsy is, is promising, especially with, as I already said, with development of uh, new probes, 1.1mm uh, probes, in combination with navigational techniques. But these methods uh, still need standardization and more studies, careful risk assessments, and robotic bronchoscopy, of course, is excellent, but it costs a lot. Uh, and in the the key for uh, success uh, of uh, the bronchoscopic diagnostic procedures of peripheral uh, pulmonary uh, nodules is actually careful 
selection of the patient for biopsy. In majority of cases, do we really need to know? Thank you very much for your attention. We thank Professor Popfish for sharing his experience with us. And now the talk by Professor Ibtisam Islam, University of Medical Center, Texas, USA, entitled Lung Cancer Screening Guidelines. My name is Ibtisam Islam. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician from Texas Tech University Health Science Center, and I'd like to thank the society for having me speak about lung cancer screening guidelines today. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, today, I'll be presenting a case from my actual lung cancer clinic. Um, we'll be talking about screening the harms and benefits and then the recommendations per the ACCP and Fletchner guidelines. So here I have a 69-year-old African-American male with no significant past medical history that presented to clinic for lung cancer screening. No past medical history, no surgery, family history was non-contributory. This patient smoked two packs per day for 50 years, but then quit in 2013. His review of systems was negative, physical exam was benign, um, and based on his smoking criteria and his age, the patient qualified for low-dose CT scan of the chest. So this is his CT scan of the chest done in 2019, low dose. And you can see where the red arrow is pointing. There was a five millimeter nodule found in the left upper lobe. But in conversation with the patient and discussing with him, we decided this was a too small of a nodule to try to biopsy and that we would just continue monitoring the patient with his yearly CT scans. So patient follows back up in one year. Um, he again is asymptomatic and he is now due for his second low dose CT scan of his chest in 2020. And this is the result that we found in his um, yearly screening CT scan. And so that five, point, that five millimeter nodule had grown to 1.8 centimeters in the left upper lobe. So again, with the results, we discussed with the patient and how to best proceed. And so we decided on bronchoscopy, evis, and navigation for staging and pathology. Um, there was very minimal lymph nodes on the right side, and he was negative at station 7, 4L, and 11L. And the nodule that we biopsied via navigation, because it was difficult re to reach, became, uh, came back from pathology as benign lung tissue. However, as I tell patients, if I have a high suspicion for a nodule, that this is cancer until proven otherwise. And so in order to prove that this was a malignancy, I sent the patient to CT-guided IR biopsy of the left upper lobe um, nodule pathology came back as small cell carcinoma. He did have a PET CT scan to, to determine if he had any other metastasis in the, anywhere else in the body. Um, and this was the only hypermetabolic area that we found. Again, it was the left upper lobe nodule, but the rest of the PET CT was negative. Because of his negative staging per EBIS and because of the negative PET minus this um, hyperbenabolic nodule, the patient was, um, we were able to refer to the patient to cardiothoracic surgery where he had a left thoracotomy with left upper lobe lobectomy and mediastinal lymph node dissection. Pathology from surgery did confirm our small cell carcinoma with eight lymph nodes negative for metastatic disease. Station five was also negative and station 10L was also negative as well. And so the great thing about the lung cancer screening is that as we all know, by the time we find a small cell carcinoma, it has metastasized and the patient doesn't have much of an opportunity. And so with the lung cancer screening, it gave the patient the opportunity to go to surgery and have that nodule dissected before it had spread. So the lung cancer screening guidelines, and this is based on the most recent CHESS 2020 international conference of the CHESS Fleischner guidelines that were presented by Dr. Peter Mazzone and Dr. Gerard Silvestri. So with any program or any screening or any procedure, you always have to discuss the benefits and the harms. And so the benefits of the lung cancer screening is that mortality reduction. And this is due to earlier disease detection. And it also allows us to take a multidisciplinary approach. In our hospital or in our clinic, we do a once a month lung cancer tumor board where we are have oncologist president, pathologist president, radi radiology surgeons. And so that allows us to discuss to, with um, patients, their, um, their uh, nodules and what has been found. Um, it also has a favorable impact on smoking cessation rates. 
Um, and then therapy is more effective in early stage disease. Um, it increases overall cure rate and more limited surgical resection. Now with harms, obviously, if you have abnormal findings or something that looks suspicious, this requires you to have a needle biopsy or surgery. Um, and among abnormal results, 24.2% with low dose CT and 6.9% radiographs, 96% had a false positive, meaning no diagnosis of lung cancer. And 11 of the percent of those positive results led to an invasive study. Um, of course, if you're doing imaging, you're gonna find incidental findings and 40% of those had emphysema or coronary calcifications. Radiation exposure, you have an increased risk of cancers, one in 108, one major induced cancer. However, the advantage of the low dose CT radiation dose is that it's 1.4 millisieverts versus the seven to eight millisieverts that you get for a standard CAT scan. Continued harms, patient distressed. Um, so you can imagine sometimes the worry that patients may have from a prolonged follow-up of nodules if you're just continuing to scan them yearly because they are a high-risk patient. However, the data found that there was a short-term psychological discomfort, but this did not affect distress, worry, or health-related quality of life. And then you can have overdiagnosis, where you identify a cancer at screening that would not have affected the patient's morbidity and mortality if it had never been found. And so for the National Lung Screening Trial, after six and a half years, 119 more lung cancers were identified in the low dose CT uh, group compared with the radiograph. So who do we screen with low-dose CT scan? So the first recommendation is you want to screen asymptomatic smokers and former smokers age 55 to 77 um, who have smoked 30-pack years or more and either continue to smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. And this is a very strong, rec this is a strong recommendation. The definition of asymptomatic here means that these patients have absence of symptoms that suggest the presence of lung cancer. Recommendation two is for asymptomatic smokers and former smokers who do not meet the smoking or age criteria in recommendation one. This is from age range of 50 to 80, have smoked 20 pack years or more, and either continue to smoke or have quit within past 15 years. Again, this is uh, suggesting annual screening with a low dose CT um, scan should be offered. Some individuals should, would be eligible may have low benefit from screening and they may actually choose not to undergo screening. Recommendation three, this is for asymptomatic smokers and former smokers who do not meet the smoking and or age criteria of recommendations one and two, but these patients are projected to have a high net benefit from lung cancer screening based on the results of validated clinical risk prediction calculations and life expectancy estimates, or based on life year gained calculations. So augmenting the criteria outlined for recommendations one and two with risk prediction and life gain calculators leads to greater equity across race and gender in eligibility for lung cancer screening and the net benefits of screening. Life year gain calculators combine the results of risk prediction and life expectancy estimates into one measure. The application of risk calculators or life year gain calculators to identify um, screen eligible individuals is, is more burdensome than using the criteria that we use for recommendations one and two. Lung cancer screening programs that choose to identify these eligible individuals based on this recommendation need to develop tools to support ordering providers in identifying screen eligible uh, individuals. In the United States, health insurance providers may not pay for low dose CD screening for those who do not meet the criteria for um, the recommendations one and two. Recommendation four, those individuals that have fewer than 20 pack years of smoking or they're younger than 50 or older than 80 um, and have quit smoking more than 15 year goes, year, years ago are not projected to have a high net benefit from lung cancer screening based on clinical risk prediction or life year gain calculators. Therefore, low dose CT screening uh, is not recommended uh, for these patients. Recommendation five, Individuals with comorbidities that substantially limit their life expectancy or adversely influence their ability to tolerate the evaluation of screen detected findings um, or tolerate treatment of an early stage screen detected lung cancer, they should not get a low dose screening. And examples of patients with comorbidities include advanced liver disease, severe COPD with hypoventilation and hypoxia and class four heart failure. Um, 
the idea is that competing mortality limits the potential benefit and harms are magnified. So when a patient comes in to our clinic and we're discussing lung cancer screening, I'm also discussing their past medical history, what it means, what the, the procedures entail. Um, and so it's not just a blanket, oh, you fit the screening protocol. There's a lot of discussion with the patients to make sure that there is a benefit to also getting the lung cancer screening. Recommendation six, low-dose CT screening programs develop strategies to determine whether patients have symptoms suggesting lung cancer. Therefore, if you have a patient that's coming in symptomatic to you, you just need to send them straight to diagnostic testing, regardless of meeting eligibility. And the final and last recommendation here, number seven, low-dose CT screening programs develop strategies to provide effective counseling and share decision-making visits prior to the performance of the low-dose CT screening exam. And so when these patients come to my lung cancer screening clinic, we try to discuss their eligibility, decisions that will make benefits versus harm about potential CT findings. And if we do find something on CT scan, um, what kind of intervention that we will need. And so there's a lot of discussion with the counselors, with the oncologists, with the surgeons, and of course, with the patients. And of course, we always have counseling about smoking cessation as well. And so just kind of in summary, you want to weigh the risks versus the benefits for these patients, whether it's appropriate to do the lung cancer screening, age 50 to 77 years or 80 um, years old, 30 pack or more, or if they've quit 15 years ago. Thank you very much. Dr. Gamal, you will start the session or will we talk about لا مش قصدي ابتسام خلاص كده لان في محاضره ثانيه للدكتور ابتسام اه اه طيب خلاص اوكي طيب دلوقتي هتبقى المحاضره الثانيه للدكتور ابتسام اعتقد في فرق واضح قوي مع الدكتور ابتسام عن الدكتور بابوفيتش الكلير ايتمز يعني قصدي في المحاضره يعني يعني دنيا واضحه بالنسبه لها بسيطه تو ذا بوينت مختلفه عن اعتقد سابوفيتش او بابوفيتش الدكتور جمال سريع بقى بس انا قصدي ويل نون وكونسايز وعارفه ايه ايه اللي المفروض يتعمل فده انا قصدي ده تو اكزامبلز محاضره بتتوهك ومحاضره تو ذا ايه تو ذا بوينت تستفيد منها انا اعتقد في المحاضره الثانيه بتاع الدكتوره بتسامح هتبقى دلوقتي هتبقى عن برضو ايبس اندو برونكيال الترا ساوند بيرسبتا اند نافيجيشن نافيجيشنال وات يو نيد تو نو اتفضلوا Sam Islam. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician at Texas Tech University Health Science Center, and I would like to thank the committee today for um, allowing me to speak about EBIS, Percepta, and navigation. What do you need to know? I do not have any final uh, financial conflicts of interest. Today, I'm going to be talking about the different EBIS types, EBIS guidelines, um, the use of EBIS for staging, uh, varicite, and navigation. So there's two types of endobronchial ultrasound probes. The first one is a radio probe. Um, it has a 360 degree images of airway and it's used to target the tissue. And as you can see here, this probe is here. You put it into the airway, it spins all around. And so the nice advantage of the radio probe is that you visually see the different layers of the airway. The disadvantage is that you're not sampling uh, your uh, area, your target area in real time. Then we have the convex probe endobronchial ultrasound. So acquire sampling tissue, the angle view is at 90 degrees and the direction of view is 35 degrees forward oblique. The advantage of the convex probe is that you can see, um, you visualize your vessels as you're biopsying um, your lymph nodes. So you have real time sampling, you don't have to remove your probe and then go in with something else. You see in real time your lymph node being biopsied with your needle as you see here. So I'll be referring interchangeably to the convex probe um, as EBIS. Um, so it's a 7.5 megahertz convex ultrasound probe that's attached to the tip, as you can see here. Um, it's placed adjacent to the area with um, your lymph node um, and a balloon, filled, uh, a balloon is filled with saline here. And so the very nice thing about bronchoscopy, about, excuse me, about EBIS is that you see both the bronch and the ultrasound are displayed on the same monitor. And so I can visualize my lymph node being biopsied here. 
So the benefits of EVIS is timing. So I can see a patient in clinic on a Wednesday and depending on availability for procedure time, I can have that patient in by Thursday or Friday, um, also pending here in the United States on insurance approval for, for EVIS. The costs are uh, limited based on if you were to do something more invasive like invasive like surgery, you have more accuracy and you also have increased survival because of the less invasiveness of it in comparison to a mediastinoscopy and therefore you're preventing futile surgeries from being performed. So the EBIS TVNA guidelines um, and these are from the chest guidelines um, as well. Um, and so this, you can sample with or without um, suction. In our practice, we use suction. You can use a 21 or 22 gauge needle. However, if I have a larger lymph node or I have a suspicion of sarcoidosis or lymphoma, I will actually use a larger needle like a 19 gauge. You want to do a minimum of three separate needle passes per sampling site. And with the additional uh, molecular analysis that we're doing nowadays, you want additional samples on top of those three uh, minimal samples that you have obtained from that lymph node. You can use EVIS for suspected sarcoidosis, suspected tuberculosis with mediastinal and or hyalur adenopathy. And you can also use it for suspected lymphoma as an acceptable minimally invasive diagnose, diagnostic test. However, I will caution if you suspect the patient has lymphoma and you're not getting those results back on your EVIS, you want to continue further workup or further diagnostic um, testing for those patients. So EBUS has a diagnostic accuracy of 91% versus mediastinoscopy, which is 78%. The nice thing about EBUS is you can get those posterior subcarinal nodes that are more accessible EBUS, and you have greater access to mediastinal and hyalur lymph nodes as well. Uh, it does rely on needle aspiration. Mediastinal lymph node less than one, less than one centimeter has a sensitivity of 89% with EBUS. So in EBA staging, you want to start with your highest stage uh, sampled first. So um, let's say I have a right upper lobe nodule here. I want to start with my N3 node on the contralateral side. And the idea is that if I start with the highest and go down to my N2, N1, is that I'm preventing upstaging by contamination. If by chance, let's say with my right upper lobe nodule here, that I started on the same side, uh, with let's say four, station 4R, but I decided or I realized, oh, I need to go back to 4L. Uh, the recommendation is actually to use a new needle, not just a clean needle. So you want to open up a new needle out of the box. Again, this is to prevent upstaging by contamination. And rapid on-site cytology improves the FNA techniques for your EBUS. Next, I'm gonna go on to discuss Percepta. So this is a genomic sequencing classifier and it helps to assess the risk of lung cancer. It has a high negative predictive value of 91% um, when down classified to low risk. So the example I use is if you use a D-dimer, if your D-dimer is negative, then you're not worried about a pulmonary embolus. However, the American College of Chest Physicians does recommend continued CT surveillance despite this low risk assessment. 65% positive predictive value when classified to high risk. And so how we do the Percepta is that we have two brushes. We brush the right main stem and the left main stem. We cut those brushes, send it off to the company. Um, and if I do not get a pathology diagnosis from uh, my bronchial EBIS and navigation, then I request the company to sequence uh, the, those samples that I have sent to them. And the idea is that they will send me back whether they, from the sequencing, this patient is low, intermediate, or high risk. Um, prior to the procedure, I do fill out a form that states uh, how long the patient has smoked for, my assessment of whether I think the patient is low, intermediate, or high risk. And so an example here is that the physician has classified this patient as intermediate, as indicated here, but when they sent off the Percepta, it came back as a low risk for um, malignancy. And the third topic I'll talk about here is navigation. So electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy, there's multiple types, including super dimension and spin thoracic navigation system. This is very good for peripheral nodules, especially difficult to reach lesions. Um, and the nice thing is you do a CAT scan the morning of or the day of the procedure. And if that lesion is gone, you can actually discuss with the patient about canceling the procedure and, and no need to do a procedure if that area of interest is, is no longer present. 
So we use the Varen navigation uh, at our university. Um, and the key differences from other lung navigation systems is that there's no fluoroscopy required. You have automatic registration and dynamic mapping via VPAD, electronic magnetic uh, chest sensors, track moving nodules with respiratory gating, um, always on tip track instruments, blind sampling are compatible with all scope sizes. And we have the spin perk as well. So the spin uh, system enables, you can either capture the tissue endobronchially here. However, if it's difficult to reach, you can do a percutaneous needle biopsy uh, yourself uh, in, in that same procedure as well. So how the biopsy workflow uh, happens is that you have these uh, VPAD uh, placements and the patient is scanned to, sent to a CT scan. The CT scan is then on the computer and we uh, go through the images, picking a nodule or the target that we're interested in or multiple targets actually. Um, and then using that system and what we've targeted, we use um, endobronchial and percutaneous if we need to, to go in and, and biopsy the lesion of interest. So why the VPADs, how are these relevant? So they're automatic registration and dynamic referencing throughout the procedure. Uh, they communicate with the system 20 times per second to up-to-date respiratory movement, and it automatically recalibrates uh, if the patient moves during the procedure. And the Varen mean registration error is 2.6 millimeter. What is the spin perk? So this is the process of using a tip track guided percutaneous needle to excise peripheral pulmonary nodules from the patient's skin surface based on their inspiration and expiratory chest CT. So basically whatever you can get endobronchially, you're coming from the outside in to get that uh, nodule. Um, and so the way that works is you have your verify, your registration ad, uh, accuracy, you navigate to the lesion, you take whatever endobronchial biopsies you can that you can also um, verify with radial EBUS. Um, and then for the spin perk, you want to locate the entry site with a non-sterile device. So you'll put the sterile, a non-sterile device on the patient's chest in the area that the nodule should be. You locate that. Once you localize it, then you're going to prep and drape in a sterile fashion that area. And then you're going to insert a 19 gauge introducer needle. Um, and then from there, that kind of makes a pathway. And so you can put your 20 gauge FNA needle in and you take um, core biopsies that you rotate around at a 90 degree angle. So in summary, convex probe EBUS um, helps us with lung cancer staging and then perceptive erocyte helps us to get the risk of lung cancer for these patients. And Varen helps us with peripher peripheral difficult to reach lesions. Thank you. الحقيقة احنا يعني استمتعنا بالدبث والاكستنت بتاع الانترفنشنال بالمونولوجي في السيشن ده دكتورة ابتسام الحقيقة يعني متمكنة جدا وعندها الاكويبمنتس وعندها السكيلز وعندها الاكسبيرينس كويسة قوي ايه قوي وان شاء الله يعني ربنا يفتح على المراكز بتاعتنا ويبقى عندنا الحاجات بتاعتها دي ويبقى في كومباراتيف ستادي بقى بيننا وبينه اتفضل <تصفيق> دكتورة ابتسام كان معانا اونلاين فيعني هي يعني ويلنج ان هي تيجي مصر ان شاء الله واحنا منتظرينها باذن الله ان هي تيجي مصر وتشير الاكسبيرينس بتاعتها ومعانا الاكسبيرينس في ناس عندنا طبعا هنا انترفنشنال برونكوسكوبست عاليين جدا والايبس كمان عاليين جدا فيعني اعتقد نعمل ميرج كويس قوي مع دكتورة ابتسام ايديها في الشغل ده يعني ات سيمز تو بي ان هي وان اوف ذا فيري امننت ان شاء الله باذن الله الف شكر جزيلا دكتورة ابتسام و دلوقتي السيشن دي اوفر وهناخد اخر سيشن ان شاء الله ونوعدكم ان شاء الله هتبقى اخر